Hello, I'm Paula Bray. Uh, I'd like to thank the NASLA Digital Skills Group for inviting me here to the Data Unleashed conference to talk about the work we do in the DX Lab. So I work here at the State Library of New South Wales and I run the DX Lab um, at the State Library. This is how we uh, communicate on um, social media. Please use the hashtag and at State Library of New South Wales is our account. So what is the DX Lab? We are Australia's first cultural heritage innovation lab and we support new ways of design thinking, experimentation and research with um, existing and emerging technologies. Uh, so this is our uh, website um, and what I'm going to do for this presentation is give you a little bit of an intro into what the DX Lab is about, where we, where we, how we got to where we are at the moment and then I'm going to go into some experiments and talk about the data and the learnings and findings from those projects. So this is a bit of a byline that we get to work with, um, made with, played with, remade. So why does a library need a lab? Well, I think, you know, libraries need to kind of place themselves in uh, a 21st century environment where um, we are really good places to be there for communities, be there as a living lounge room in the city, but we're also in a position where we can uh, provide new and interesting ways to research and give access to the materials that we hold. And so as we look at what our future audiences um, coming through that will be using libraries are very, will be very tech savvy, they're born in the digital age, and we need, to, um, we need to keep up with their needs. So we need to actually be experimenting with uh, new and innovative technologies and using our collections and data to inspire them when they're older to come and use libraries as well. So I guess the DX Lab is um, really trying to uh, get audiences to think about this and to think of libraries as, as contemporary spaces, as um, digitally active spaces, as places where they can come and get access to um, data and materials for them to actually make innovative projects. So really the DX Lab is this place for experimentation, uh, research, but mostly we are a place for collaboration because innovation really does happen through collaborative process. So we try and invite people in to work with us. We work with um, outside universities, researchers, um, all across uh, the library staff to really try and produce innovative experiences. And we're really lucky that we are um, able to work with the many items um, that are currently being digitised here throughout our digitisation program. Uh, we have access to over 7 million digitised images at the moment and um, that's a massive amount of data that we, we get to explore. So really our remit is to push some boundaries um, in design thinking with uh, web technologies but also for on-site digital experiences. Um, we're not a business as usual team. We um, we, we work sort of outside of um, that kind of realm to really test some ideas and look at solving problems in new ways. But we also really want others to be able to do those things, being a library. So we want our data to be used, to be researched, adapted, and um, we want people to create with them. So we are using a hashtag made with SLNSW so that if people do use our collection data, then uh, we would love to hear about it. So how is the DX Lab going about this? Uh, when we initially started, we set up a, a library-wide kind of brainstorming sessions and we wanted to get down to some really core values. Uh, and these are the values that came out of those brainstorming sessions with our staff. We're here to collaborate, obviously experiment, to create, engage, be open, and um, this lovely one on the end is surprise, which came through very strongly through the staff. And playful too. Uh, we do things because they matter to the organisation and to our audience. 
So we're not just looking at things because they're shiny and outside of what the library needs to do. We want to design creatively. We're in this position of constant prototyping so we don't necessarily have to always overbake projects. Um, we can iterate on them, we can learn from them, publish them quickly. So we're in this lovely kind of constant prototyping space. So now over to some of the data that we've been working with here in the lab. And it's a bit like being a kid in a candy store here with the data. Um, there's so much that we can start to work with and we need to sort of um, have a reason for looking at a specific uh, data set, which is the kind of like this messy um, process that we go through and then completely kind of refine into why are we using it. Um, skills are really important in this space and this is just a really quick snapshot of the type of different types of skills that make up a DX Lab uh, project when we're working with data. Um, and so it's about people being having uh, a cross section of skills that we, we need to work with. So now I'm going to really focus on some of the experiments that we have done with our data. And this is our first one, um, first big uh, project that we did with a creative agency called Grumpy Sailor. Um, this is Loom. Um, Loom was built, the first phase of Loom was built fairly quickly. Uh, we wanted to um, show our collection in a new way, but we also deliberately removed the search bar from our collection interface. Um, we felt that it was important to sort of test the idea of allowing users to have a serendipitous uh, exploration through our collection. Uh, we're also using um, uh, uh, the latest web technology, WebGL, which is moving it into that 3D space. Uh, we also wanted to limit the data set to um, the context around Sydney. Um, so with so many pe people searching our collection uh, catalogues online each year, what they normally do is have a sort of one-to-one -one relationship with the data. So you, you have a search, you kind of know what you're looking for, you get a return and there's this um, little white box kind of process. So with Loom, we were challenging that and we wanted to strip that back. We wanted our users to have a bird's eye view of the collection as well as a one-to-one -one relationship collection uh, experience. This is the first phase. This is um, a very visual phase. It's sped up for the purposes of this um, uh, uh, demonstration. It's a timeline. Um, you do get to look at um, items from the collection around Sydney in relation to um, the year they were um, made. At any point you can uh, click on um, the relevant link out to our catalogue record. So it's really important when we build things that we allow our users to deep dive further into researching that particular item through the catalogues. So once we had built Loom phase one, which was very much uh, around and limited to this um, uh, map in Sydney, um, due to the vast amounts of data that we have in our collection, the limited capacity of the browser and the, the um, amount of content that we were pushing through WebGL. But through the process of iteration, uh, we felt that um, it was really important to discover different lenses into the same data. So different ways to be able to get to the collection uh, through data visualization. So we decided to continue the project and um, uh, again, challenging that notion of um, you know what you're looking for when you research our collection. Here you can see circular keys being highlighted but we wanted to turn that into a location-based um, layer in WebGL. So really about giving that locally contextualised information, um, showing me how to use the data, but also inspiring possibility for others to be able to use it. So this is the second phase of Loom, which is um, based on um, uh, an atlas. 
and um, it's called Atlas. So you'll see here that for a start, you're getting to look at the same data, but from a much uh, longer distance. It's not the one-to-one -one relationship. You're looking at the collection um, almost as a whole, um, based on location. And again, you can drill down into each item. Uh, you can get to the one-to-one -one relationship and then deep dive into the catalog. Uh, but it's a completely different way for us to see the way that our collection works. Again, no search, just exploration. It might be through the tags and the subject headings. Uh, it may be through um, you starring and favouriting certain items and then coming back to them. But for us, it was um, a really kind of interesting way and a very new way to look at our collection. Um, so then we wanted to, so we had the visual phase, we had the mapping phase, and the third and final phase that we set ourselves was purely around the metadata. And this is what that metadata for those th around 3,000 items uh, uh, that we have selected. This is the amount of metadata that we were dealing with based on time. And again, this is a, an early prototype version, a working version that we published um, of being able to look at any topic uh, we're pulling in the Trove API and you can deep dive um, to Trove to see pictures, photos, newspapers, periodicals that relate to that particular topic for that particular year. So this really informed us as to the amount of data that we we're working with for the third phase, but it also set us a challenge of, well, how do you visualise metadata that makes it meaningful? So this is the next step was to uh, visualise the metadata in WebGL um, and we decided to represent each topic as a, a, a ball in space. This is the very first prototype um, that was uh, again after the design phase started to take shape. Um, so the particles and the topics are kind of in this space. Uh, the more topics um, in relation to that year are obviously bigger and higher and um, the smaller topics are, are represented in a tiny dot. So then this went on to, um, to be published like this. So here you can see this is a timeline of all the metadata that is within this data visualisation. You can drill down to specific locations. Um, Again, no search bar. It's about you exploring um, time and space and um, the relative topics and tags. So here you can see um, cities and towns was the largest um, tag topic for the, this particular year, 1938. And you can drill down further and see what those images were that have that particular topic in it. So for us, this is uh, a new form of researching. Um, it's a new way of um, getting into the collection based on time and place. And, um, and that's what it looks like. So from there, we did learn a lot about um, working with the collection and the data in this way. Um, we really felt like through the iterative design approach, we were able to look at the collection from a distance, which I think is a really interesting thing for cultural heritage organisations to do. Uh, we're so used to looking at smaller collections uh, around our research, around um, uh, our exhibitions, but when we take a step back and we can see the collection from a different perspective, it gives us new insights. The lenses help us view things differently. We learnt to sketch not only in code, but also in um, pen. Um, the, the importance of structure in metadata, um, you know, data is messy, but you have, you, you have what you have and you have to learn to work with what you have and try and make that better. Um, and that there's a curiosity around being able to uh, serendipitously look at our collection. Uh, so then this um, particular um, interface, which isn't live yet, is um, 
recent searches that are going on here uh, at the library, but also online. So what people are uh, looking for across our catalogues, um, the different catalogues are represented by the different colors. So we can start to see um, a responsive nature of what's going on in the media. People are searching, um, obviously, our catalogues at that time. It can also inform us of um, the types of content that we should be potentially working towards. So we're actually looking at ways to visualise this on site here at the library to engage our visitors as they come through the door. Um, uh, it's really important for us as a cultural organisation to give back to not only the sector but to people in the creative industries who are researching, um, who are experimenting with data and collections. So we felt it was really important to set up a fellowship which the library has been doing for a number of years and does really, really well, but we wanted to have a dedicated digital fellowship. Uh, and there seemed to be um, a lack of these in Australian cultural heritage organisations. Uh, so we were fortunate that a creative um, partnership of Alyssa Lee and Adam Hinshaw were successful in um, being the inaugural fellows for the DX Lab. And they have built this uh, visualisation in real time, which is taking the search terms a step further. So they're not only just looking at the searches that um, uh, our visitors are doing, they're looking at the items that they've clicked on. So in effect, this is um, in real time, a interface that's curated by the crowd. Um, there is obviously staff searches going on as well and they're being picked up, but it has a lovely pulse where it's busy at times of, um, in the afternoon, less busy during the evening. And so we're starting to see the collection in a completely new way. This is researched by our audiences. It's um, time stamped um, and it gives us new insights to things that potentially we didn't know um, some of the staff didn't know were in the collection. We are pulling in um, book covers to represent the books. The images are given uh, precedence because they've been digitised at such a high resolution. And uh, we have a colour coding system for books that are from the Dewey Decimal System, uh, which has been created by Chris Gall at UTS. So the uh, fellows have referenced that existing colour palette. Um, so again, this is... Um, a way in which we can look at our data and our collections, but in a completely new way. Uh, so he, this is just an early screen grab, um, again, uh, sped up for the purposes of the demonstration. This is what um, one day's worth of data looks like, and it starts to become a sort of a, an artwork in itself. Um, this is three days um, worth of data and you know you get exposed to collection items that you've n you would never necessarily search and you again you start to see the responsive nature of what's happening in the media coming through in a visualization uh, of what's happening at the library so it's bringing that dna of our, our what's happening in the library to the surface This is a, um, a map in our collection. It's from 1877. It is the proposed railway extension line that was um, uh, proposed by Mr. John Young. And it was quite an innovative, forward-thinking uh, interpretation of the inner city circle line that we have today. And it was one of the first collection items that we were inspired to look at when we were researching for Loom. So this, this map has kind of stayed with us and there's all these data points at the top of the map referencing place, which we have marked up um, just in red here for our own purposes. But we've taken this map and all those collection data points and we've actually created a, uh, a very playful concept piece around transport. So here you see um, we have the map 
and we are comparing John Young's proposed city circle line with today's um, current city circle line. We're referencing some data points uh, with our collection from 1877 or around 1877. So again, this is um, taking a very uh, beautiful but static map in our collection and uh, using some technologies to bring it to life, to uh, look at the, um, the kind of genius of, of John Young and his proposal. This is called Young Sydney and it's on our website at the moment. Uh, we also run a program called um, the Digital Drop-In Program because we feel it's really important for uh, people who have skills uh, that um, we bring them in to work with us and to work with our collections and our data. Uh, this is one that we did, this is our first digital drop-in that we did with um, a curator from the Tweed Regional Museum, Erica Taylor, and she had the idea of um, a city regional comparison tool and um, here you can see there is um, two lots of data. Um, her data from her museum is at the top, I'll just start that again, and um, the State Library's data is at the bottom. So the whole concept is a timeline and it's, a, it's looking at um, main streets. So as you can see, uh, on the top left hand side uh, for 1907 uh, there is um, uh, the Tweed Regional Museum Main Street picture and below is the State Library's um, Main Street of Sydney. We're also pulling in uh, the, the trove um, keywords from newspapers that um, are from the respective areas. So from this two week sprint, um, which we thought we had finished, <laughs> Uh, we were asked then to uh, do an on-site experience for an exhibition using the same type of UX and um, design but with different content and through a large projection and touch screen. So we recoded, um, we recoded this, we worked with uh, some new collection which was from the um, Government Architects Office uh, exhibition that we had, Imagine a City. Again, it was a timeline and a comparison tool, but an on-site experience. So from a two week sprint, uh, it turned into a sort of a more business as usual uh, on-site experience. Um, one of the second fellowships we were able to do was the Digital Learning Fellowship. And we set a task of working with some data from what we call the Visionaries data set, which is um, an educational uh, uh, data set that's been um, digitised here for some time, but is not currently available online. And we put out a request for um, a creative technologists to come up with a new way to visualise this data. And this is just a little snapshot of what's to come Jeff Hinchcliffe from the um, University of um, the ANU um, Design has won that fellowship. And he's presenting the data in a very uh, ch uh, new and challenging way for us in that it's based on sort of retail and um, the sort of gathering shopping mentality. So it'll be really interesting to see how this data set and interface uh, evolves. Again, a brainstorming session for um, a digital drop-in, working with this data set, which was from our Rasa collection of uh, indigenous place names that were collected in 1899 to 1903. They're surveys and uh, letters um, that describe uh, indigenous place names um, and meaning. Um, so in one week, uh, after Chris McDowell from uh, New Zealand was able to explore uh, the data, work with our Indigenous services team, work with our um, st uh, staff on knowledge around this collection, work with a couple of external artists such as Jonathan Jones. He was able to build um, what we're calling Weemala, which was um, 
a visualization of the letters and survey forms. So they've all been digitized, they're all accessible on our online collection, but they're, they're, you sort of need to know what you're looking for. So in this particular concept piece, you get to um, extract the uh, place names and the meaning in relation to a map. So suddenly we've, we've been able to make this data set uh, come to life and we're, we're able to take this um, now sort of back to community to have conversations around the relevancy of this data, the accuracy of it, and it's a lot easier for uh, users to um, get into the data. Uh, it's, it was built very, very quickly and um, we would love to take this further and do um, the second iteration. So another sort of quick, fairly quick project that the DX Lab did was taking um, the panoramas from our collection and um, actually presenting them in a little way like you see currently with 360 degree video um, that's you know on Facebook and around. And we wanted to somehow just have that feeling of being immersed in the um, the collection data from the from our amazing panoramas. Um, so this uh, is now available on our DX Lab website and it's just um, another way of getting access to um, our collections. Uh, it's not, it's an open source tool, so it's not something that we have, we have coded. We've just used existing technology and our data and presented it in a compelling way. So again, um, you know, a challenge uh, that we wanted to solve for one of our curators, Sarah Morley, who was working on um, our uh, beautiful gardening um, exhibition um, that we had over the summer, where she had a challenge of um, having these beautiful flip books that she couldn't um, show in its entirety in the showcase. Uh, but she could only have one page open. So we um, just applied um, the slider technology to uh, these um, little beautiful pop-out books. Um, again, not our technology, just solving a problem, but it, um, it was quite successful for us and got picked up in uh, the UK and we got a lot of traction through um, Capability Brown promoting um, our work. So, you know, sometimes it's not the really complicated ways that you uh, work with your data. Sometimes it's really, really simple and quite obvious ways that you can actually achieve um, great access. So one project that we um, have paused just for the moment but is uh, interesting in that it is not necessarily just collection related data, it's um, data that comes out of um, the services that we provide here. Our information and access team um, said to us that they sometimes have a problem with um, not being able to communicate directly to the client around the time it takes to go and retrieve books from the stacks to fulfill their stack slip requests. So we started looking into uh, how potentially we could solve this um, or at least give those clients um, some sort of idea of the length of time that it can take to get a request. So we started um, looking into NFC technology and tracking um, the actual journey of the stack slips um, and that we may therefore be able to provide personalised services to uh, an opt-in solution for our clients if they wanted to know exactly where their book was travelling um, and what time it might be ready so that they could potentially quickly go into the city, they could go and get lunch in the um, cafe, grab a coffee, have a meeting. So we're not tracking the technician or the um, person, we're just tracking the slip and the journey. So stay tuned for that one, we'll see whether we can provide a visualisation at the entry point where um, people make their requests. Again, um, a very simple experiment. Um, this is a thousand and one postcards, uh, WebGL one collection. The home page was treated like an artwork, uh, and the collection is to be viewed as uh, group locations. 
So each filter is um, bringing you up here the postcard from that collection based on its location. Again, a completely bespoke collection interface that we've been able to experiment with, but it's a beautiful way to get access to the um, Broadhurst collection now. Again, um, you know, in the DX lab, we, we find it's really important to actually um, speak to the people who are using our data, using our collections, find out what it is they find difficult, what it is they enjoy, what they want to make, how we can help them. So we do two events a year. This was one of our first ones, Meet the Data Owners. Um, and it was really great talking to creative technologists, developers about the use of our data. The second one we held was um, a UX rapid prototyping workshop. It was really playful. Uh, we had um, a room full of a mix of people really interested in working with our data. We set them two challenges that were uh, real DX Lab challenges and they were to sketch up really quickly some solutions for working with this data in completely new ways. Um, and these are just some of the examples and I love this one because it relates to our stack slip in that someone had drawn up a beautiful little message when your book is actually passing some of the really important parts of the collection, um, you could potentially have a little message saying, your item just passed Captain Cook's journal. Um, again, through research, um, not necessarily heavy um, innovation, but being able to replace um, some high-res images in Flickr through an API allowed us to do some research. The developer had to build a tool called the Album Resolver because we couldn't find the exact item from the album um, to match it up to the Flickr uh, ID and swap it over straight away. So this tool was built um, using image recognition technology and um, which then later went on to us being able to build a, a really fast tool for um, the whole of staff to download uh, any high-res um, image that they want from the collection through um, an interface. So out of, out of sort of a very quick turnaround um, piece of work, we were able to build some business as usual tools that have significantly increased the um, access for staff to get to images very quickly. Um, again, this is um, some of the use of dairy and the amount of time that we've saved has been um, quite interesting. Uh, sometimes it's not always about large data sets or really complex data sets. Sometimes it's just about simple, small things that you can do to allow visitors, um, users to get your data. So um, we just put uh, our curators, um, our research and discovery branch got together um, some spreadsheets of um, 50 things from the collection and we've put them all up in GitHub for people to use. So sometimes it's just more about providing um, smaller packages of data that people can be inspired to start working with. So they're all up there under um, uh, 50 libcats. So I'm just going to touch on some takeaways from the things that the DX Lab has learned from working with our data. Um, that you know, we've really learnt that experimenting is very important because it, it, it can lead to changes in um, business um, in the business. Uh, it, uh, prototyping is critical for the process of design thinking. So your prototype um, can help you iterate and then to provide better um, design solutions for your interfaces or experiences. We found data is messy <laughs> and will not always do what you think it will do, but um, we need to, we are in a position now where we can look at why that is and how we can work on providing some cleaner data to work with. Uh, partnerships are really important. Um, think differently here about who you can partner with. Be prepared to pivot through the process of iteration. Um, Tell your audience it is an experiment and that it's okay, it's been published early, it's, uh, you know, something that we can learn about together. Sketch lots, encode, build upon your code uh, and make it available. 
um, share everything that you, uh, you find, um, make your data freely available and put it in GitHub. And that's it. So thank you for having me.